Thank you, Jeff, and thank you to our choir and our band. Well, just so everybody doesn't have to ask the question, I keep hearing it now, so I'll just go ahead and answer it. Um, the question is, is how much uh, tissue did we use last weekend? And the answer to that question is none. We used our shirts. <laughs> it was... Uh, it was a great weekend last week. It, last weekend, it was a long weekend, uh, but uh, by God's grace, we dropped Shirley off at Wachita, and uh, we left her there. So here we are, and there she is. Uh, got your Bibles? Turn to the book of Mark, chapter ten, if you would. Mark, chapter ten. While you're turning there, let me just remind you, next Sunday, uh, we're going to start the series, uh, just a, a short series of messages called Q&A for question and answers, answering tough questions. Uh, and uh, I actually had somebody mention to me this week that they were going to, to send a question, but they were afraid that I would tell everybody that they were the ones that asked the question. So let me just, uh, you can be rest assured that I am not going to tell anyone who asks the questions. I'm just going to try to answer the questions to the best of uh, my ability under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and through, the, through God's Word. So if you, have any, if you have questions about God, about the Bible, about church, uh, just about just different issues that the Bible, you think the Bible might speak to in general, then I would just encourage you and I would ask you to, uh, well, to to go to the website and, and, and ask your question. There will be a link on there for you to ask it. and You can actually look in the bulletin and you'll see some of the questions that we're going to be talking or the questions that I'm going to hit next week. Um, so in Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, let's begin reading in verse 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approached him and said, Teacher, we want you to do something for us if we ask you. What do you want me to do for you? He asked them. They answered him, Allow us to sit at your right hand and at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We are able, they told him. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink. And you will be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to give. Instead, it is for those it has been prepared for. When the other ten disciples heard this, they began to be indignant with James and John. Jesus called them over and he said to them, You know that those who are, uh, those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles dominate them. And their, and their men of high positions exercise power over them. But it must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In God's word, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God remains forever. So let me ask you a question. What does a great church look like? Does a great church play a certain kind of music? Does a great church have a certain type of preacher? Does a great church have a certain type of Sunday school or a certain type of group ministry? Does a great church have, have a certain focus on, on missions or maybe a focus on youth ministry or on children's ministry? What does a great church look like? Maybe a great church involves, involves a little bit of all of those things, right? Well, Jesus actually tells us what not just not only what a great church looks like, but Jesus actually tells us what it means to be a great follower of his. In fact, what Jesus is going to do is Jesus is going to redefine greatness for us. So in, in Mark chapter 10, actually... Uh, Actually, Mark chapters 8 through 10 is actually is, is a couple of chapters. It's like a discourse on discipleship. 
Jesus deals with things in Mark 8 through 10 that, that really deals with what it means to be his follower. He talks about the cost of following him. He talks about what it looks like to follow him in marriage. It ta- he talks about what it looks like to follow him as, as a parent or trying to parent your children. He talks about what it looks like to follow him with, with your money and with your finances. And so Jesus deals with all of those subjects in Mark, chapter, uh, in, in Mark chapters 8 through 10. But here in, in Mark, Mark 10, he talks about greatness. Well, in Mark chapter 10, verses 32 through 34, Jesus actually told it. He came to his disciples and he said, listen, and they're, it said, he, they're on their way to Jerusalem for their last, their last trip to Jerusalem. And, and Jesus says, listen, guys, we're going to go to Jerusalem and something's going to happen. This is actually the third time he's told this to them as well. He says, I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be tried and I'm going to be crucified. But he says, don't worry, because on the third day I'm going to, be, I'm going to rise again. And it's in that context that Jesus has this conversation. Actually, it's in that context that Jesus clarified. In fact, in fact if, you're, if you're taking notes, here's something you can write down. Jesus clarified a misunderstanding about true greatness. He clarified a misunderstanding that his disciples had about true greatness. And so here's what it says in Mark 10, verses 35 and 45. It says that James and John, they were the sons of Zebedee, approached him and said, Teacher, I want to stop there and make make a real quick point. These disciples could approach Jesus. You see, the reality of it is there is no way for sinful human beings to approach a holy God. But when, when Jesus left heaven and came to earth, he became the way for us to approach our heavenly father. And these two guys, James and John, two of these, these are just two of his, his 12 uh, apostles, two of the 12 that Jesus spent the most time with. He, they, they approached him and they said this. They said, teacher, we want you to do something for us if we ask. In other words, Lord, would you just kind of write a blank check for us? We're going to ask you to do something, but we just want you to say yes before we ask you to do it for us. And, he, and Jesus says, with the grace that he does so well, he says, what do you want me to do for you? And then it said that, that he ans- they, they answered him, allow us to sit at your right hand and at your left hand in your glory. So James and John, two of his closest disciples, they weren't just two of his disciples, they were two of his, of his top three. They were two that spent the most time with Jesus. And they, they're, they're on their way to Jerusalem. Remember what they're doing? They're getting ready. Jesus is getting ready to go be crucified in Jerusalem. But they still don't get it. You see, James and John, along with all the other disciples, I might add, James and John still have a picture of Jesus going to Jerusalem to set up his kingdom. Going to set up his throne. In fact, what, uh, what one author, Tony Marita, said, he said, they were going to Jerusalem to look for a throne, but Jesus was going to look for a cross. But James and John, they, they still didn't get this. They still had this picture of Jesus going up there to, to look for this throne. And, what did, and, and, and they, said, they said, we want to sit at your right and their left. Now, what were they really asking for? They were asking for greatness. They were saying, Teacher, can we be great in your kingdom? Only what they were really wanting was they were wanting authority. They were wanting a name. They were wanting prominence. They were wanting a place to rule alongside of them. And I love the way Jesus answered. And it says in verse 38, But Jesus said to them, You don't even know what you're asking. He says, are you able to drink the cup or to be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? Now, what is the cup and what is the baptism? Well, in the Old Testament, the cup represents the wrath of God. The cup represents the fact that, that God is going to pour his wrath out on mankind. You don't, we're not going to read it, but you can write down Isaiah 51, 17, which is a verse that talks about, this, about that. And baptism, what does baptism represent? Well, baptism represents being immersed in something. 
Now imagine this picture that Jesus is drawing here. They, they, the disciples should be able to get and understand this whole idea of a cup and a baptism. And Jesus says, I'm about to go. I'm going to go drink and take, take the wrath of God upon myself. I'm not just going to have the cup of God's wrath poured on me. He doesn't just say, I'm just going to have the cup poured on me. Imagine having a cup of water poured on you versus being immersed in water. Jesus says, I'm not just going to have the cup of God poured on me. I'm going to go be immersed in the wrath of God. By the way, this is the reason Jesus came. This is the reason that Jesus was here. In fact, this is the difference between religion and the gospel. Because what religion says is religion says, I'm going to do everything that I can so that I can, so that I can reach God, so that I can be with God, so that I can make myself right. We try so hard. That's what religion says, but that's not what the gospel says. The gospel says Jesus is the only way to be right with God. That the only way that somebody can have a right relationship with God is if, is if Jesus himself the very Son of God would be punished and have the wrath of God not just poured out over Him, but for Jesus Himself to be immersed in the wrath of God. That's what the cross was all about. That's what Jesus going through that was all about. It was about Him being immersed in the wrath of God. Now watch their response. Verse 39. We're able, they told Him. We're able. And Jesus said to them, Oh, you will drink the cup I drink, and you will be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. In other words, Jesus says, You actually are going to experience a horrible death. Now, I don't know that I really want Jesus to tell me that. I mean, I'd like to say one day that I do that. I mean, if that's what God calls me to do, that I have the heart and the willingness and the, and the courage to do that. But I really don't want Jesus to tell me that ahead of time. You know? But yet, that's what he says. He says, you actually are going to experience something like that. And they were. They were martyred. They gave their life. In fact, I believe, I believe I, well, actually, John may not have been martyred, but I know that, that James was the first one who, who gave his life of the apostles. He was the first one. John ended up living a long time where he even wrote some of the books in the New Testament, including the book of Revelation. But it goes on and says in verse 40, But to sit at my right hand, Jesus says, or left, is not mine to give. Instead, it's for those it has been prepared for. In other words, he's, he tells me, he says, What you're asking, that's not my business, guys. He says, guys, that's, that's God's business. Think about this. We have a tradition in, in sports, in our in our culture in our nation when somebody is is really good maybe they were really good in college or maybe they're, they're really good in professional sports and they they retired after a certain amount of time what do they do they they retire their their jersey and then they take it and they lift it up to this place of prominence and there's normally just a handful of jerseys lifted up there now imagine that a guy while he's still playing goes to the coach or goes to the head of the team and says, hey, you know what, I think you just need to go ahead and lift my, my jersey up there. I think you just need to go ahead. He says, that's where I belong. In essence, what, what James and John were doing was saying, hey, Lord, will you go ahead and retire my jersey? Will you go ahead and give me this place of prominence? But Jesus says, guys, I can't do that because God has already prepared greatness for someone else or for, for, for some, some others. And before he tells them who, listen to what it says in verse 41. When the other ten disciples heard this, they began to be indignant with James and John. In other words, they got irritated. They got mad. Now just so you don't think, that they, cause I don't really think that what's going on here is they're saying, Jesus just got done telling them what he's going to do and you want a place of greatness? 
you guys need to just go sit in the corner. That's not what was going on here. I think what the problem with these other disciples was, was James and John beat them to the punch. They got there before they did. Because they wanted, I mean, this fits Peter's personality perfectly. They wanted the place of prominence. Why? By the way, let me just say this. If, if you ever wonder whether you can trust the Bible or whether, whether, whether the Bible is true or whether it's trustworthy, it's stories like this that make me think, yeah, I think I can believe what he's saying. And you know why? If I was starting a new, a new belief, a new religion, if I were starting a, a new church, I wouldn't tell the bad stories about my people. I'd tell, them, I'd tell the stories about how honorable they were, about how righteous they were, about how godly they were. But right here, we get a picture of the disciples that I just, I can't imagine wanting to, wanting to, to put this in my first book of religious truth if I were starting a religion. But yet, that's exactly what he puts in here. I believe that we can trust God's word. So now Jesus is going to go on and he's going to show the pathway to true greatness. Listen to this. Jesus called them over and he said to them, You guys are stupid. No, he didn't say that. Listen to this. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles dominate. In other words, they rule over or they overpower. Those that are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles dominate them. And their men of high positions exercise power over them. In other words, he said, you've seen how greatness works in this world. It's top down. In other words, greatness in this world is, is defined, uh, defined by how many people you have under you. In other words, uh, financially, you, you might be considered great in this world if you have more money than others. In your business, you might be considered great in this world by how many people you have under you in your business. Or in a church, you might be considered great in this world by how long you've been a member of a church or by how, many t- how long you've been tithing or how long you've been, a- been serving in that church. He said, that's the way, that's the way greatness in this world works. But Jesus is going to totally redefine greatness. Instead of greatness being how many people you have under you, Jesus defines greatness by how you place yourself under others. Let me say that again. Instead of greatness being how many people you have under you, Jesus redefines greatness as how many people you serve. And you put yourself under. Look at verse 43. But it must not be like that among you. Did you hear that? He, he, tells, his, he tells his disciples, this is what the world says. But, but he says, but that's not the way it's supposed to be with you. On the contrary, in other words, he says, you don't conform to the world. You don't do what the world does just because the world does it. Your main goal is not to see, okay, this is what everybody else is doing. This is, in other words, that must be what I'm supposed to do. Jesus says, no, no, in verse 43, on the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave to all. See, here it is. The pathway to greatness is serving others. In the kingdom of God, the pathway to greatness is serving others. Not how, by how many people serve you. Greatness in the kingdom of God is how many people, is not how many people serve you, but how many people you serve. How many people you serve. And next we see what, that Jesus actually sets the example. Look at verse 45. 
For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And then he tells what that really means. And to give his life a ransom for many. And just so you know that this isn't all talk, I want you to go back just a few verses to verse 32. I want you to look at what it says. It's in Mark 10, 32. Remember, this is right, this is right before this whole teaching happens. It says this, They were on the road going up to Jerusalem. What's about to happen to Jesus? Can, I t- can you tell me what's about to happen to Jesus? He's going to be arrested and he's going to be crucified. Now listen to this. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem and Jesus was walking ahead of them. Now I don't think... You know I was watching the Olympics with my wife the other day and I learned something new. I did not know that we had speed walking in the Olympics. I'm sorry, that may just be me, but I was just like, are you, are you serious? I thought that these people are, are, are walking, but I'm thinking, are they jogging? What They're doing this thing with their legs. What's going on here? Now, I don't think Jesus was speed walking to Jerusalem. But there's another thing that Jesus wasn't doing. If there's, sometimes if there's something that I dread, I walk a little bit slower. I kind of put my head down kind of keep to myself but this that's not the picture we get of Jesus right here we get a Jesus they're they're on the road going to Jerusalem and Jesus is walking ahead of them and then it says they were astonished but those who followed him were afraid and then taking the 12 aside he began to teach them so Jesus is walking toward his own execution and he's the first one in line now, do you remember what happens to Je- what, ha- what Jesus' disciples do once Jesus is arrested? They weren't in line behind him, I'll tell you that. They scattered. Why would Jesus do that? Why, why would Jesus be the first one in line? Why would he say something like, I didn't come to be served, but to serve, to give my life as a ransom for many? Why would he do that? Because he knew that's the reason he came. Because he knew that it was not about him. So he redefines greatness. And says the true path path to greatness is serving others. See, that's what makes Jesus so great. Jesus was not not out there just trying to, to throw his weight around as the Son of God. He didn't just go out and every time somebody wanted a miracle, he didn't just, just, just snap his fingers and, and do a miracle just so that, so that he could say, look who I am. That's not what he was all about. He was trying to point people to God. But he was very focused in what he did it. Why? Because he wanted to serve people who had true needs. But this is the thing that I also noticed as I was studying this this week. This went, really down, this went deep down into the hearts of these disciples. I mean, the disciples, when they heard Jesus teach this, and after they saw his example, and then ultimately after they saw him fulfill what he said he was going to do, some of them began to write stuff down. In fact, I'll bet all of them eventually wrote stuff down, but only a few of them do we have that, are, that were actually uh, uh, inspired by God. Like 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 2 and 3, Peter is, is, is exhorting pastors. He's challenging and he's teaching pastors here in his, book, in his letter to, to Christians. He says, shepherd God's flock among you. Not overseeing out of compulsion, he says, but freely, according to God's will. For not, not for money, but eagerly. And then listen to what he says in verse 3. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And I just have to say that when I first, I've read that passage of scripture a lot of times, but I went, when I read it in the context of, of this, thinking about how, how Peter sat there and he watched Jesus walk ahead of them. And then finally James and John come up and catch up to Jesus just so they can say, Hey Jesus, will you do something for us? 
And Jesus teaches them this. And then to see what he writes here, i got to tell you, that's really convicting as a pastor. Because I don't always set a good example. Because it's not, always, it's not always easy to serve. You may not believe this, but I don't always like every part of my job. My responsibilities, they're not, all, they're not always easy. And, and I don't always do it with a servant's heart. In fact, I don't always do it at the front of the line. Sometimes I throw Jeff in front of me. You're the man. Thank you. But, but seriously... What he says right here, he, he speaks to pastors. He says, pastors, you set the example. Because if it's going to happen in the church, in fact, I had a friend, uh, a mentor and friend of mine tell me this week, he says, the, the, uh, the, I just forgot what he said. But basically, he, he said something to the effect of, as, as the leader goes, so goes the church. As the leader goes, so goes the church. So let me just say this to you. The, the last couple of weeks, this passage of Scripture has really been, been eaten at me. So I make it a commitment. As a shepherd in this church to to be a better example when it comes to serving and to ministry. Because listen to what he says next in 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10. Actually a few a few verses before but listen to this. Remember Peter was impacted by this and he wanted he wanted Christians to be impacted as well. He says based on the gift each one has received, he said use it to serve others. As good managers of the varied grace of God. So what he says, he's, he, he, he teaches that everyone has a gift. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been given a gift. You've been blessed with a gift. And the gift that he's given you is a gift of, of, of his grace. We sang about grace in this service. Grace is not only about not being sent to hell or not being allowed to go to hell, but grace is also seen in our lives every single day of our lives. Because grace is a way that God reveals his glory to this world. And he gives us and he, and he shows us his grace by giving us gifts and giving us abilities to do things. But he says, those gifts of yours, those gifts of my grace, those are not to be used for selfish means. Reminded me of Johnny Football. Remember Johnny Football? Johnny Manziel? More talent, more ability in this, in this guy's body than, than, most, than, than most teams have. I mean, this guy was a great... I mean, when it came to crunch time, he could handle it. He was the guy that... It, that I mean, in college, you wanted him on your team. But all that talent and all that ability, he thought, it, at some point, he thought, you know what, this is, this is about me. It's not about the team. And he gets up and he, and he signs contract, contracts. He makes big money. And before you know it, where's Johnny Manziel now? He might be in prison right now, actually, but at least on trial for some things that he's done. But he's not playing football. You see, most of us knock ourselves out of the game because we want to use our gifts for personal gain. But that's not God's will. That's not God's plan. Peter heard what Jesus said, and he's like, wow. And he says, God, God has gifted you with something. Not for your glory, not for your ability, but he's gifted you so that you can be a blessing to those who are around you. It impacted John so much that in John chapter 13, John shared something that Jesus did just a few days later after this Mark 10 passage that nobody else in the Gospels shared. 
In John chapter 13, Jesus and it takes his disciples to this, this house. And in this particular house, there's nobody there washing the people's feet, which is, by the way, the, the responsibility of the lowest of the low servants in the culture that they lived in. And it says that Jesus took off his robe, he wrapped it around his waist, and he got on his knees and he started washing his disciples' feet. And by the way, I believe that Jesus looked for the lowest of the low things in their culture to show them what it meant to be a servant. This impacted John so much that he put it in, in, John thir- in, in, his, in, in what he wrote. And in John 13, 13 to 15, listen to what it says. He quotes Jesus. He said, you call me teacher and Lord. This is well said. For I am. Jesus says, I am your teacher and your Lord. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. So John looks back at Jesus and and he says, that's our example. He says, We're not just blowing smoke here about this. He says, Jesus really lived this stuff out. He really did this. I mean, Jesus could have have quoted the meatloaf song to his heavenly father and said, Lord, I'd do anything for love. But I won't do that. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus got on his knees Not only that, not only did he get on his knees, he got on a cross. He carried his own cross. And what Jesus says is, see, that's the pathway to greatness. He redefined greatness. It's not about working your way to the top. In essence, it's about working your way to the bottom. It's not about how many people serve you, but it's about how many people you serve. It's not about how many people, uh, how many people you're that that you have following you, but it's about the fact that you're following Jesus and you're leading others to be servants. So here's our question of application today, because I really want to I want to apply this to our church as a whole. What we've said as a church is that, we, that, that our vision here at Elmdale is to be a multi-generational church and to be a multicultural church that multiplies disciples. But I want to answer a question for us here today. Because some of you, I know some of you are asking because I've heard somebody's told me that some of you are asking. A few of you actually asked me of it, but you, you've, you've asked it and, I, and I've heard that you've asked it. So I want to answer this question. If we're, a multi, if we're trying, if we're striving to be a multi-generational church and a multicultural church that multiplies disciples, what's your part? What does it mean for you to be a multicultural, to be, to, to be a minister, to be a servant in a church that's striving to be multi-generational and multicultural? In your bulletin, if you've got a bulletin, you got a handout that says finding your place. Pull that out. Raise your hand if you don't have this, this handout that says finding your place. Okay, ra- raise it high. We got, we got a couple that are, okay, good deal, good deal. There's a few people s- sitting around. See, what we've, what we've tried to do is we've put on, put on here some areas. Not every area. There's some areas that aren't on here. Like one of the areas that you see very regularly that's not on here is, is, is what happens up here on, on Sunday mornings. Ooh, careful, that would have been painful. When, when you serve, you can, you can sing in the choir, you play in the band if you play an instrument, serve on the worship team. Those are all opportunities. Raise your hand if you, if you still need one.
So what we put on here is some, some places that, ways that you can serve. If you want to be a part of what it means of, of this church as, we, as we're trying to be multicultural and multigenerational, here's some places that you can serve in. And by the way, in the preschool, children's, and student ministry, you get to, you're able to invest in, gen, in different generation and in different cultures because that's where the, the greatest amount of, of, uh, of that is actually at. But those aren't the only places. You can serve in Sunday school. You can serve in extended session. What's extended session? It's, it's, it's helping keep the nursery while we're worshiping in here. You say, well, gee, I don't know that I, if I want to do that every Sunday. Good, you don't have to do that every Sunday. In fact, you can put that you only want to do it a certain number of Sundays uh, 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 per, per two or three months. But it's a way that you can invest in, in little children. It's a way that you can invest in, in, in young families of, of mothers and dads who, 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 want, who need to come in here and worship so that they can grow and be discipled. On Sunday evenings, when we have Sunday evening services, there's going to be an opportunity to, to take care of kids, uh, of, of preschool age kids. Tuesday women's, Bible, Tuesday, uh, women's Bible study that takes place at 9.30 on Tuesday mornings. There's, there's young moms that would love to come to that, and sometimes they need, need somebody to take care of kids. That would be a way to do it. Wednesday night's another example. Look over to the right of that where it says student ministry. There's places to serve in Sunday school. On Wednesday nights, they're getting ready to start a new ministry called Disciple Six. In just a little while, I'm going to let uh, Brad come up during our announcements and just say a few words about that. But that would be a way for you to disciple and to invest in some students and in some young people. Acts 1-8 Mission Day is on October 1st, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a, in a moment as well. Another thing that's really needed within the student ministry is when they go on, when they go on trips, like on uh, September 23rd to 25th, they're going to be going to Siloam Springs. And they're in, they're in need of, of adult sponsors to go for something like that. That would be a way for you to serve and for you to invest in, in young people and young ministries. Now, now listen... I know. I used to be a youth pastor. There's a reason I'm not a youth pastor anymore. Okay? So I know how difficult it is to, to relate to people that are, that are younger than you. Or I know how, how, how fr no, frustrating is not the word I want to use. How, I, just just how, how hard it is, or even intimidating it is, to try and minister to people, uh, to to, to children or to, to youth that, that you just feel like you're, you're a world apart from. And it's, and it's true. It's, it's not easy. But guess what? It's also not as hard as we think it is. Sometimes it's just a matter of being there and being, being somebody to encourage and to love them. See, there's going to be people who are in this room right now whose first response when it comes to working to students is going to see, nope, not me, but yet at the same time, deep in your heart, the Lord's speaking to you and you say, you know what, I think I'm, I'm trying to forget God's speaking to me right now. Because God's called us to serve in areas like that. Children's ministry, you can serve in Sunday school, you can serve in splat for worship. By the way, if you want to know what splat looks like and you've never seen what splat looks like, I've never seen what splat looks like, I'm always here. But on September the 17th, there's going to be a family worship night in which they're going to basically do splat for kids' church on a Saturday night so families can come and worship together. If you want to know what the, what's going on in there, you want to get your feet wet, you want to see what's going on, then September 17th would be a great time for you to do that. And you can, you can see how, how fun it can actually be to be working with children and with students. But we want to challenge you. We want, we want, to, want you to encourage you to do that. Wednesday night choir is another opportunity. Bus ministry is another opportunity. You say, I don't know that I can ride the bus every, every Sunday. Well, good. You don't have to ride the bus every Sunday. Who said you have to ride it every Sunday? Maybe once a month. Maybe once every month and a half. But you can, but you can serve there be a great way to invest in these kids and in these students that, that we, we get to pick up. We get the blessing of investing in every single Sunday and Wednesday. Be an easy way to do it. And then Monday, after school Bible club. And God has just blessed us to, to be able to be planted right next to this elementary school. 
There's so many ways and so many opportunities that, that we can invest in that school. You can even volunteer over there if you wanted to volunteer over there. There's, there's so many ways to minister over there. But one of the ways is, is, is we get to host a Monday a Bible club every Monday afternoon from 3 to about 4.30. 3.30, well, 3.30 to 4.30. And, and, and that would be a great place. In fact, I'm, men, there's a need for men to serve there. There's a need for, for ladies to serve there. And, then, and, and listen, I also know there's going to be some in here who are going to say, you know what, I'm just too old to do that. But I promise you, you're not too old to do that. Unless physically there's some health issue that keeps you from standing up, walking in there and sitting down a chair and encouraging kids, then you're not too old to do it. Does it get kind of loud? Yeah. But you know, those kids love to be loved on. And it's a great opportunity. If you're, if you're not working on Monday afternoons and say you can't do it every Monday, guess what? Nobody's telling you to do it every Monday. But maybe you commit to do it one, or one Monday a month or two Mondays a month. But it's a great way to invest in, in different generations and in different cultures. The Elm uh, Young Adult Ministry also, it's, it's, a, it's, the, it's the ministry that, that our church has from, uh, eight, for ages 18 to 30. They meet every Thursday night in Annex. What Annex is that that they meet in? Is that Annex 5? Three, Annex 3. So the, the first building on a uh, house of ours on the back corner of the lot. Listen, it's a great oppor- it'd be a great opportunity for you to go and just meet and hang out with, with students uh, and, and, and young people who are, who are in the workforce. Give you an oppor- opportunity to invest in these people. Hey, let me tell you something. Just for a second. I'm closing my Bible. I'm not done, but I just want to talk to you for a second. Did you know that this church cannot function with only young people? This church cannot function. If this were a church of only young people, and I, you, you can define young however you want to, right? I'm not going to try to do that. If this church were a church of only young people, it, it wouldn't survive. Well, why? Well, because young people need to be discipled, need to be mentored, need to be taught. Not only that, it, turn, it just so happens that, that it's, it's many of our senior adults and our older people that are, are the prayer warriors. And we need prayer warriors here, here at our church. And it also happens, that, okay, so this may be the elephant in the room, and this may be brought up a lot of times that in, in contexts where it ought not to be brought up, but it also happens that it's the older people that tend to be the, be, the, the best givers, They've been taught to give, they've been raised to give, and they are also maybe just at a place where, they're, where it's easier to give. Maybe it's not easy to give, but maybe it's easier to give. So here's the truth. Guess what? A church cannot be a church. This church can't be a church of only young people. But guess what? This church can't be a church of only old people either. And again, I'll leave it to you to define what that means. Well, why is that? Well, because without younger people, eventually this church is going to close its doors. So what does that mean? (laughs) That means we need to be a multi-generational church. Does that mean we've got to make every generation happy? Not necessarily, but it does mean sacrifice. It does mean... here's, Here's the thing. Let's just think about the Elm Young Adult Ministry. I got the privilege this past, uh, this past week to go to Ecclesia College and, and invite a few, a few of the new incoming students to, our, to the Young Adult Ministry. And we pray that some of them will, will come and be a part of that. But I guarantee you when, you, got, when you got young people coming in who are freshmen, you know what they need? They need some loving adults in their lives. And they may come, come to this on Thursday night and not come here on Sunday morning. You say, well, that's not right. Well, but we've got to train them where they need to be. That's why when we go out as missionaries, we go to their country and not say, hey, y'all come over here so we can witness to y'all. That, that's not how it works. You see, I'm just, I'm just telling you, you have abilities, you have talents to, to go into these places and, and invest and to train, and, and I know we don't like to think of ourselves as mentors, but that's exactly what you have the potential to be, to mentor these people, to talk to them, to encourage them. 
So you got the Elm Young Adult Ministry. Those are some ways that you can serve. There's some missions opportunities as well. First, I think it's the first Saturday of every month. Is that right? Laundry Love? First Saturday of every month? Wow. And what an opportunity. You say, well, I can't serve it the first Saturday of every month. Well, maybe you can serve one Saturday every three months. And what do you get to do there? Well, you get to help people uh, wash their clothes. And you get to be a smiling face. You get to, you get to love on people that maybe, maybe they don't go to church. Maybe they do go to church, but they still probably need some loving, don't they? And it's a great way for you to serve. It's a great way for you to invest in other cultures and other, in, in other generations. Snack packs. Not every Sunday, but now that school started back, probably every other Sunday, once every three Sundays, you get an opportunity as soon as church is over to go and fill these little uh, these plastic bags with snacks so that the kids over at the elementary school are able to eat and to have some snacks. Acts 1-8 Mission Day, Saturday, October the 1st in Fort Smith. The students are already planning to go to that. But I can tell you right now, our missions committee is, is, is wanting to take a, a couple bus loads to it. Well, why is that such a cool deal? Because you get to go on a mission trip and you, don't have, and you get to sleep in your own bed at the same time. Hey, have you ever been on a mission trip where, you didn't, where the sleeping quarters weren't comfortable? You know how big of a blessing that is. So October 1st, it's a great opportunity. India mission trip, January 14th through the 28th. And again, what another great opportunity to go and to share the gospel in the, in the place in the world where there's millions upon millions of people who are dying and going to hell. And then trunk or treat, Saturday, October 29th. So it can be a lot of be opportunities to, to, to rub shoulders with our community on that day. A few other opportunities here. Church work day. Hey, next Saturday, the 27th. I've already been told that if we had, if we had 10 strong men, and if we, had, if we had 8 strong men and 4 kind of strong men, because some of you, I know if he said strong men, I'm not strong. Okay, listen, okay. So let's say we had 6 strong men and, and 6 kind of strong men and 1 or 2 w- wimpy men. Okay, that's fine. There's, there's going to be plenty of work to do. What, what, why is that such a big deal? Because when that building gets remodeled, our Laotian congregation is going to be able to use it for worship on Sunday mornings, and they've been needing a new place to worship because they, they, they'll grow like a weed because Max and his, and, and his team over there are doing such a good job with the Laotian uh, community in our, uh, around here. And then our student ministry is going to have that whole building as well. They're going to get to use it in, on the times when Laotians aren't using it, and they're also going to have all of their, their classes over there. So what are we doing next Saturday? We're not just working. We're investing in other, in other cultures. We're investing in other generations. We're making a difference. You can be a greeter on Sunday morning. Can you smile and hold out your hand and hand out a bulletin? You can be a greeter. And what, how much easier does it get than that? Maybe even before Sunday school you could be a greeter. Get here a few minutes early. You get to greet people right before they come in for Sunday school. So this is what I'm, this is what I'm asking you to do. And there may be something on there that you know about that's not on there and that you say, you know what, this is something that I want to be a part of this. So you can, there's a blank spot there on the right side of it. Just, just write it in. It's kind of like voting. You don't like who you're voting for. Okay, write somebody in, right? <laughs> hey, by the way, I'm not suggesting you do that in November, okay? Okay? I guess that's a whole other story, though. Um, but write your name. And you don't have to write your phone and your email address. Write one of the two just so we can contact you, okay? And then check off the, 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 let's say check off the top five that you might be interested in. One, two, three, four, and five. And then here's the thing. Let's say you check it off and you do it for a couple months and you find out, you know what, this really just isn't for me. Guess what? We'll let you move to number two. Number two doesn't work. Move to number three. We want you to find the place where God's called you to serve. God's put you here for a purpose. I'm convinced that God's put everybody here who He wants here right now for this season, for this time, for His purpose. 
And it's not to merely sit on a pew. God has put you here for a reason. So you can fill that out, drop it off in the offering plate when it goes by here in just a moment. But I want to give you, I want to add, add just three, three quick points. Number one, if you aren't ready to make a sacrifice, then don't fill out that piece of paper. If you aren't ready to make a sacrifice, then don't fill it out. Because we're going we're gonna to have to be making sacrifices in this process. No, number two, be prepared to experience change. That's right, I used the C word. Be prepared to experience change. Be prepared, Sunday school classes may have to move. By the way, we've already moved some Sunday school classes, and I'm not sure how many more we can actually move around. But, but, and thank you for those of you who moved. I'm, just, I'm grateful for that. I'm so appreciative, appreciative of that, and so are our students and our kids' ministries. There may, be, there may be storage things that have to be moved, that have to be replaced, that we have to move things around so that we can fulfill this mission and this vision of being multicultural and multi, multi-generational. But just be prepared because there's going to be changes. You say, well, Billy, you must be having something up your sleeve. Well, honestly, I don't know that I've got anything up my sleeve. I'm just saying, I know how this works. Change is coming. And be prepared. Why? Because we're not living for today. We're living for the future. We're not setting our minds on things of this earth. We're setting our minds on things above because God has a greater purpose for the future. And then third and finally, whoever you are, however old you are, however young you are, wherever you're at in the middle, commit to praying. Commit to praying. You know whose church this is? It's God's church. You know whose student ministry this is? It's God's student ministry. You know whose preschool ministry, whose children's ministry it is? It's God's. By the way, parents, you know whose kids these are? And those are over there? And those are over there? You know whose kids those are? They're God's. So I want God in on the lives of my kids and my students. I want God in on the lives. Let me say this. I want God in on the lives of my my senior adults as well. Young people, you need to know that, that there's a lot of people that have gone, far, gone before you and, and made a lot of sacrifices so that you could worship here. There's a lot who have given in a lot of ways so that you could have the place to worship that you have. So we need to be able to work and to serve them as well. Pray for the ministries. Pray for the workers. Pray that God would send out workers into the ministry. I'm going to ask if you would to bow with me. Father, thank you.